We're going to begin with the director of the Sapphire Project. And the Sapphire, by the way, uh, stands for the Stellar Atmospheric Function in Regulation Experiment. Maybe Monty or some of the other guys will uh, break that down for us, but uh, I like the the name Sapphire, so however you did it, you made it work out somehow. (laughs) Uh, Montgomery Child's background in uh, mechanical engineering and applied physics. Uh, the, The founder of the Artus, corporation and uh, just a great piece of good fortune that he should cross the paths of the electric universe a few years ago as he did and gang up with these guys to create this wonderful project. Welcome to the stage, Monty Childs. Thank you, David. Wow, it's, uh, we were here last night, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed the first, I guess really the first cut of uh, the Sapphire film that Ben Gedlow uh, put together. Um, these presentations that you're going to see today are different than they have been in the past. Uh, I've given an overview of what Sapphire is in my first evaluation a few years ago, and second, and third. But Sapphire uh, was launched, and the proof of concept was conducted, and we got uh, some spectacular results from it. So before we get into it, um, I want to thank everyone for coming here to this conference and the thousands who are watching this live. And for those of you who are new, uh, welcome. So I'm truly, I am truly privileged and honored to be here. Uh, if it had not been for uh, Walt Thornhill's work and some questions that I had, and for Scott and Bruce Mainwaring for making this possible, uh, we would not be doing Sapphire. Now what I want to get into today is, uh, what the team will get into is you're going to get into some detail. and. Some of the detail is fairly complex um, with regards to the methodology that we bring to bear on Sapphire. Uh, We've worked very hard to break down the concepts of designs of experiments and the scientific method. Uh, Some of you may criticize some of the slides because they may be simple, but we're trying to get across some of the concepts and principles of of what it means to do data acquisition and, uh, you know, the kind of testing. So I think you're going to find that Sapphire is an extraordinary science endeavor, and that it's leading us to new horizons in physics. There are two ideas about the sun. The one that you're all familiar with is that the sun is a nuclear fireball. The gravity over billions of years compressed matter in the core of the sun to cause its thermal temperature to be around 15 million degrees, and that it's this pressure that is responsible for the nuclear reactions causing fusion and that through various ways this energy migrates and finally escapes through the layers of the sun creating the photosphere which is cooler at about 6,000 degrees Celsius and then further on out to the corona where the temperature again rises up to around 2 million degrees But this is one of many disparities that heliophysicists have spent years working on to discover why does the sun shine. But there's another concept, a model, if you will, a hypothesis that the sun is electrical in nature, that the sun is a positively charged body in a generally negatively charged environment. I was asked to review and do an evaluation and analysis of the electric sun hypothesis and see if it was possible to test it. The evaluation showed that based on prior work by Crookes, Birkelin, Schmidt, and Fiorito, and many others, that in fact a test was feasible. The sapphire moved from a possibility 
to a reality. I needed to put a team together, the best minds, pragmatic, and above all, disciplined. The Sapphire team does not hold to any one theory or another. We do not have a horse in this race. We do not belong to the EU community. We are testing the electric sun hypothesis to shake it out and see if it's false or if the test supports the theory. Sapphire is pure science, what is called basic research. But why do this research? What if we discover that electricity is playing a much greater role in the formation of stars and the way they work, the processes and the mechanisms that cause them to shine? What if stellar fusion is occurring in nature for another entirely different reason than pressure and heat? How might this affect the way we get energy to heat our homes or travel? What about space travel? What if space really is teeming with charged particles, as Walt Thornhill has proposed? Personally, I think the positive impact toward humanity would be huge. You will see today the questions we ask, the techniques and methods we impose, and the technology we have used and will use in Sapphire. Phase one was to determine if we could measure inside a hostile plasma environment and gather data. And now, phase two is to apply what we learned. Let me recap some of the notable things we discovered in phase one, the proof of concept. We found that the plasma formed its own spherical atmospheres, not only one, but two, then three, and at times over 15 stratified atmospheres. They were all spinning around each other. But the plasma, it's also extremely sensitive. Almost anything that has the ability to accept or emit an electric charge or magnetic field can change its behavior. But there's even more. We discovered that when we zoomed into the core, we observed what appears to be a dark layer between the extremely hot ion cloud and the core. The ions did not act normally by going out toward the cathode region. They appeared to be trapped. And they got even hotter and more dense. And then another event occurred. This cloud of ions got so dense, it blew off into the chamber atmosphere. There was a pressure spike during these events. Even more importantly is that although we limited the power to only 1,800 watts DC, the oscilloscopes measured a short-lived power surge of over 2 million watts, and at times at over 10 million watts. Now, for some perspective on this, the Bruce Nuclear Power Plant in Canada, the largest one we have, produces 7 million watts. Sapphire produced anode tufts, and they would spin, sometimes at the poles and other times around the equator. Now, I'd like to clear up a few ideas floating around regarding pushing the plasma or overpowering it. Sapphire does not act in this typical manner. There are times when it does not want any more power, regardless of how high we turn up the voltage and current. Let me repeat. There are times when the core does not want any more power. Yet at other times, when you see the plasma in this state, it can't get enough power. And it will eat as much power as it can get. Optical spectroscopy shows definitive line broadening, which means we have higher temperatures the further we go from the anode. Intensity scans and analysis indicate electron and ion trapping between the double layers. 
The design of experiments revealed the interaction of factors involved were not linear, as you might expect. They are nonlinear relationships, indicating possible, a possible natural balance of the plasma. This relates to capability and our ability to repeat SAPPHIRE's experimental setup and get repeatable test results. It also means we understand the factors responsible and can recreate particular plasma phenomena. We found that SAFAR often released huge power surges, as I mentioned. We measured with radio frequency and electromagnetic frequency what we call a heartbeat. Why did these happen? What is the heartbeat all about? Can we listen to SAFAR? You see, it's DC power but we're getting a heartbeat, and that's a response to these phenomena that we see around the core of the plasma, I mean, around the core. <clears throat> and then we found we were getting copious amounts of atomic mass of three. And Lowell Morgan will speak to you about these, these things. As you might imagine, though, we were quite surprised by these preliminary findings, but the one that has us really puzzled is the atomic mass of three. Is it helium? Is it ionized hydrogen? Tritium? All three? If it is helium three, although we suspect there won't be much, then the implications for sapphire in the world are huge scientifically. You see, if this is helium three, it means there is fusion occurring in sapphire. Now, last month, we submitted our first paper for publication, and it's available here at the conference. So now the big question, how? How do we test the electric sun hypothesis? If we're able to, if we are to do this, it will mean we need to introduce into the expected plasma discharge instruments capable of measuring and gathering data. No, this is not sapphire. This is NASA's new Solar Probe Plus. They've got a bigger budget than we do. <laughs> the Solar Probe Plus will fly into the sun's corona loaded with instruments to understand how the sun's corona is heated and how the solar wind is accelerated. But you will see we are designing and engineering even more in the Sapphire. We have developed our own Solar Probe Plus. We call it the gimbal probe transporter, and it will allow us to create a flight path to move the instrument probes through the plasma corona, down into the dense plasma discharge and electromagnetic fields, and then orbit around the solalus, and then take a journey out to the far reaches of the cathode regions. This short video was created as a walk around of sapphire. The two units on top, on either side, are the gimbal probe transporters. The probe tr allows us to attach a variety of instruments and give us complete freedom to explore throughout all of the plasma discharge regions. The probes are isolated from the plasma so they don't interfere with the discharge and are driven by servo motors with a positional spatial accuracy of 0.05 millimeters. Now we're in the design and the engineering phase right now and we're just wrapping up the main, the main part of the design. So that's why you don't see other equipment attached to it. The probe gives us, in engineering terms, six axes of freedom. And by isolating the instruments from the main vacuum chamber, the probe allows us to change out the probes without having to repurge the main vacuum chamber. And this allows us to move the probes around in three-dimensional space. Now, this is important because a chamber of this size, there we go, a chamber of this size is about three cubic meters, and in order for us to purge the chamber, it would take about three days in order for us to purge it and get all the water out. 
And this design not only, not only allows us to move the probes around in three-dimensional space, but we can remotely, we can re retract the probes back, turn a valve, isolate them, and then change the probe tips out. The servo technology will allow us to pre-program motions or probe flight paths similar to what we see with a satellite or what a comet might do. The other probe can follow this probe. We can do differential measurements. And I'll show you a little bit more about that uh, as we move along here. So now that you've seen the gimbal, the next question is, how do we get the data back to the instruments? Each probe is mounted to the long shaft you saw moving in the chamber in the previous video. In Sapphire's case, the signals coming from the optical and mass spectrometers and Langmuir probes travel up along the probe and through the probe shaft. Then exit out through vacuum sealed flanges to the respective computer controllers. So this is where things get a little bit complicated. Introducing instrumentation into Sapphire Chamber is a bit of a challenge, but these are the, these are the instruments we'll be using. Langmuir probes for ion and electron density, temperature, and much more. And this will allow us to map out the electromagnetic field in 3D, both static and dynamic, by the way. Mass spectroscopy for atomic and molecular analysis. Chamber and probe pressure. Plasma voltage and current. And this is all in real time, by the way. Polarimetry. UV photoimetry. Optical spectroscopy. And by the way, op optical spectroscopy, it's used to uh, see ionized emissions in nanometers or one billionth of a meter. And to put these challenges into perspective, uh, we need to change the probe tips out. And this means we need to incorporate a quick disconnect or plug-in for the optical spectrometer. Now, if you know anything about fiber optics, they're extremely fine. They're like a hair. And uh, the quick disconnect, you see, when you disconnect it and you put it back together again, you have to line them up. And if you don't line them up, you're not going to get a signal in your, uh, back through the fiber optic, back through the spectrometer and to the camera, and then pick up the signals you see. So let's say we're out at thousandths of an inch, or approximately one twentieth the thickness of a hair on your head. This misalignment uh, will need approximately 50,000 nanometers. In spectroscopy, that might as well be 50,000 miles. But I'm a toolmaker, and we can make this work. In the upcoming video, we'll look at spatial overlap and what the gimbal probe transporter will allow us to do. I've suppressed the chamber walls so you can see things more clearly. The probe will allow us to measure in two places at one time while moving the probes through the chamber. This allows us to measure the difference between two regions at the same time to see if ions are accelerating, as an example, or if the electromagnetic field is stronger in one area than another, which we expect it will be. It also allows us to do synchronous motion of one probe to the other, and we'll be able to use joysticks to manipulate the probes remotely. So if you remember the small anode tufts, if we bring the probe down there, we can move it with a joystick to bring it into the region of the anode tuft and measure, measure its characteristics. Now, the purple and yellow represent two conical, you might say, spatial envelopes, three-dimensional spatial envelopes. And what they're showing you here in the video is that they're overlapped. 
So they're fairly large, but it allows us a huge amount of freedom without interrupting the plasma. But this is not all. To thoroughly test the electric sun hypothesis, we'll be looking at ways to test the interaction between the sun and comets. The Rosetta mission have landed a spacecraft on the surface of Comet 67P, and we have access to the data. It's rocky, and it does not appear to have any water or ice on it, but yet it's emitting cometary ion tails and an array of ions and hydrocarbons typical of comets. And this is what Dr. Franklin Anariba was talking about the other day. And Michael will be talking to you a little bit more to, uh, after I speak about what we're going to be looking for. But the two probes, as they move, as they move uh, down into the chamber, we intend to put cometary material on this. We haven't decided what it's going to be, but uh, Michael was uh, he's pretty uh, excited about this, so he went out and bought a, bought a piece of olivine. I don't know what you paid for it. I don't know what you paid for it, Michael. But uh, apparently... Olivine is, uh, is one of the materials we suspect comets are, are made of. So what we'll do is we'll mount the olivine or other materials and uh, onto the end of one probe and follow the, fi the, and follow the flight path directly behind the comet with probe number two, all the while gathering data and ions hydrocarbons, optical emissions, Langmuir probe data, and much, much more. So I want to thank you all today. Um, it's it's been, a, been a pleasure, and I'm privileged. Thank you.